Good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's 28th meeting of 2018. We have apologies from John Finney and Shona Robson. George Adams is substituting for Shona and we welcome him back to the committee. Agenda item one is consideration of whether to take items five and six in private. The first is consideration of possible witnesses and the second is the draft report. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Agreed, thank you. Agenda item two is an evidence session on post-legislative scrutiny of the Police and Fire Reform Scotland Act 2012. I refer members to paper one, which is a note from the clerks, and paper two, which is a private paper. Panel one will hear from um, two panels, and panel one is the first panel with Simon Rouse-Jones, HM Chief Inspector, Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, HM Fire Service Inspectorate in Scotland, and Douglas Scott, Senior Policy Advisor, and Graeme Jones, Safer Communities and Community Justice Manager with Scottish Borders Council. Um, I thank the witnesses for their written evidence, which is most helpful to the committee in advance of our actually hearing from you in person. And Mr. Rouse Jones has indicated he wishes to make a short opening statement up to about a minute and a half, if you, if you could to update us on the Scottish uh, Borders Council. Um, Scottish Borders Council also, Douglas Scott, um, also a brief opening statement. And we start off with you, Mr. Rouse-Jones. Yes, good morning, panel. Um, I felt it would be important, actually, and helpful for, for members of the panel if I just mention that the uh, Fire Service Inspectorate is totally independent from uh, both the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service and from Scottish Government. Um, the role and purpose of the inspectorate is defined in the uh, Fire Scotland Act of 2005 and exists um, to provide independent risk-based uh, and proportional professional inspection of the uh, fire and rescue service. Um, its purpose is to give assurance uh, to both the Scottish public and the Scottish ministers that the service is working uh, in an efficient and effective way uh, and to promote improvement of the service. Uh, operational um, service delivery is a matter for the Chief Fire Officer and the Services Board and it's important that the Inspectorate uh, doesn't get involved in the day-to-day -day delivery of uh, the, you know, the service. So my responses panel is therefore to be in respect of my observa ob observations within the Inspectorate's role. Thank you for that. And Mr Scott. Uh, thank you for inviting us today. Uh, Scottish Borders Council was a Pathfinder Local Authority to pilot the local scrutiny arrangements that came into place with the Police and Fire Reform Scotland Act 2012. As you will see from the information note that we circulated to you over the years, we have worked very closely with Police Scotland and the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, and we have built up very positive relationships with these organisations. Uh, this joint working has been underpinned by a co-located Safer Communities Unit uh, located within Scottish Borders C uh, Council, which Mr Jones here uh, manages. And this has enabled us to undertake a range of successful prevention and early intervention initiatives. The Council has used a, a community planning uh, and partnership approach to work with the Police and Fire and Rescue Services, which comes through in the scrutiny arrangements and in developing and taking forward both the local police plan and the community fire and rescue plans. And both of these plans links with the community planning work of, of, of the council and partners. Thank you very much for that. We'll move straight to questions. And could I start by asking the panellists that the, the committee has heard varying opinions on whether reform has actually achieved um, benefits in terms of service deliveries. Could the witnesses expand on what they see as the main benefits or negative consequences of the 2012 Act? And who'd like to start? Mr. I'm, I'm more than happy to start if I can. I think from, from our judgment, I, I believe that the, the reform process is certainly um, currently providing effective um, um, impact with regards to uh, what it was there for. Um, it certainly met the, um, the frontline responses, I think, um, and the uh, specialist resources. So for me, I think that the, the main area that if it didn't happen, um, I think there would have been significant uh, cuts within the, you know, within the service across the, the Pan-Scotland. Pan 
Um, I believe that um, certainly there are varying degrees of, um, of areas within Scotland um, itself, and obviously there are, there are different tensions within there, but generally I think that certain areas within the, um, the legacy services would have really struggled with regards to being able to provide a service. Uh, so for me, that was one of the main sort of areas of benefits of the, um, of the change of reform, etc. Uh, but I think it's certainly brought some significant benefits as well. I think it's been able to uh, be able to have national resources which um, haven't been able to be easily um, transferred across Scotland uh, in the previous uh, legacy elements. I think it's brought uniformity and uh, an element of uh, being able to deal with the training um, across the, you know, Scotland in a far more economic and, and effective way. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Mr yeah. Scott? Um, <clears throat> The, 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 the board, uh, basically, we have we've had very close uh, scrutiny and performance uh, uh, from the work of, of the board. Um, and, this has, uh, and, and this has been done on a quarterly basis. Uh, the meetings have been attended by both the local and divisional police uh, commanders, at times representatives of the, the, the police authority and also from the Fire, Fire and Rescue Board. And, uh, and this has enabled us to uh, support uh, and look at ideas for initiatives uh, such as tackling underage drinking, uh, support for young and old drivers, and also preventive uh, theft on farms and, 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 and rural, rural crime. Um, also, uh, we, we've also been able to focus on things which really are important to the borders, and that comes through in the various plans. So there, from the, from the police point of view, the tackling domestic abuse, likes of road safety, which is a major issue for us, uh, violent crime, uh, antisocial behaviour, uh, drugs and alcohol abuse, and protect, also protecting people uh, who are vulnerable. And we've got, obviously, with the demographics in the borders, there's a whole issue around older people and vulnerability and issues around missing persons. And also in terms of acquisitive crime as well, in terms of rural crime, which is a particular uh, issue for us. Now, in terms of the Fan Rescue Service, uh, again, uh, a lot of work in terms of um, dwelling fires, but that's expanded into making people safer in their homes. Uh, vis uh, visits to homes have enabled uh, information on, on, on vulnerabilities to be uh, linked into other services. Also, in terms of community resilience, uh, in terms of non-fire emergencies such as flooding, and we've been able to get specialist units into the borders to, to help us with respect uh, to that. Uh, also, in terms of road safety, uh, which I mentioned for the police, but also applies to fire as well. A number of initiatives there that fire and rescue have played very closely into. Also, challenging antisocial behaviour and also uh, reducing the occurrence of unwanted fire or alarm signals. And that's something that's, uh, uh, that the initiative's taking place at, at the moment in, in the borders. Uh, so, uh, as was mentioned, it's certainly what is brought in is, apart from the localised perspective, it's also enabled uh, specialist uh, support to come in uh, to the borders as well. Thank you. And um, move to our next question, which is from Daniel. So, uh, one of the, 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 the key uh, arguments made for reform was about the provision of consistency and also access to specialist services right across Scotland. So, I was just wondering if I could ask uh, Ms., uh, Mr. Ruth Jones if he has sort of uh, any general insights and any particular examples that, that, that support uh, that. Certainly with regards to the, the national resources, um, there have been um, some significant sort of examples around the flooding, around areas of um, the, the major fires that have happened in, in Glasgow and so forth. It meant that areas could be moved or um, resources could be moved far more easily across borders and so forth of the existing borders areas um, than it was before. Certainly there was that facility, but it was a little bit more cumbersome. Now as it's a... Um, as it's one particular service, it means that they can plan far better um, with advanced knowledge and so forth of being able to move the resources. So certainly within floodings, um, et cetera, they, they're able to uh, pre-plan and move um, the resources around to that degree. I mean, just following up on that, I mean, one of the, 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 the sort of phrases that gets used by the fire service itself is about the ability to have the, the right resource in the right place at the right time. Now, the, the FBU has 
raised questions as to whether or not that that can be stated uh, without qualification. I was just wondering kind of what, what your view is on that and, and whether or not you share any of the, the sort of reservations that the FBU have about, about that. No, I, th I think um, for me um, the, the days are gone where resources should be static. Uh, I believe that um, risk is changing all the time and with a, a service that has that flexibility to be able to move things serves the public far, far better. Uh, we used to have a standards of fire cover uh, many years ago which um, looked at resources just remaining in certain areas and staying in those areas. The standards of fire cover was set up really to protect property um, and it was there to... Um, and, and primarily for property uh, related, going back to 1947, basically. And uh, certainly now with uh, these integrated risk management plans and all the other bits and pieces, it allows services to actually identify risk, be able to place uh, the, the elements of um, the equipment in the right places and the resources. So although uh, I can understand where the, the Fire Brigade Union might be coming from, um, I think that that is, uh, needs to, we need to move or the service needs to move into a more modern way of delivering its service. So, so in, in, in relation to that point, one of the, the associated points the FBU make is that they think that it would be uh, useful if we restored the statutory response times, which, which we no longer have. Um, you know, both in terms of providing a benchmark and also providing kind of clarity in terms of actually what level of, of uh, cover, uh, you know, we, we have. Is that a point that you would share and re reflect um, at all? No, I, I, I wouldn't ref um, ag agree with that at all. Uh, I believe that um, by being able to be far more flexible and being able to uh, identify risks, it should be done on risk rather than on a prescriptive uh, approach. So I think that um, by moving resources around to meet the risk is far, far more uh, effective and far more uh, safe for the community and also for the service itself in being able to deliver that particular function. Thank you. So uh, clearly I've, I've directed my, my questions to Mr. Uh, Ralph Jones, but if, if there was any sort of insights that, that Borders Council had, I'd, I'd be very interested to hear them. If I might respond to that, <clears throat> what we've done in the Scottish Borders is kind of develop our scrutiny arrangements, um, and now we have uh, a monthly um, sort of oversight group, which is cross-party membership. The police attend, uh, Douglas Scott and myself also attend, and we have uh, one of our analysts comes along, and what that gives us an opportunity to, with the, I suppose some political uh, involvement, is actually look at what are the areas of demand that are being placed within the Scottish borders, particularly around kind of antisocial behaviour. Uh, and as Mr. Scott pointed out, road traffic collisions are a particular problem for us, particularly those that are serious or fatal. Uh, and what we agree is a kind of monthly work plan. And clearly the police have got independence around how they deploy the resources, but <clears throat> it gives some um, local involvement around what are the areas of concern. So there's the analytical component, but there's also an opportunity for members to bring constituency concerns to that meeting and have a direct conversation with the police about it. And clearly we can then also offer up resources that we've got within the council to support the police activity. And one of the things that we're looking to do is kind of put a bit of breadth into that. So the fire service are a, a, you know, a, an attendee that could potentially come to that because they've got something to offer. And it's not just a, a single organisation's responsibility. I think there's a sort of collaborative nature of the work that we do in the Scottish borders. We don't have lots of resources across all the business areas. And a lot of the work we do is so kind of in collaboration. So <clears throat> you've got to have some support from the different organisations to achieve the end result, um, which is the way we've tried to kind of develop things. But your point about kind of national resources, the, the road collisions is a serious problem for us. And whilst the local officers do work around speeding, uh, visibility, road checks, these kinds of things, what we have got is opportunities to get some additional cover through roads policing or the safety camera partnership to try to improve our um, sort of prevention response. Uh, but clearly if there's a, I suppose, a more dynamic, serious incident, you know, the police would just draw down the resources that they feel was necessary at that particular time. And we've had situations in the borders where there's been serious crimes and there's been no uh, shortage of uh, police resource to deal with those particular issues, whether it's around 
um, community reassurance, investigation, or any of the kind of specialist support services that kind of underpin that. Thank you. Rona. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, one of the main drivers of reform was the financial imperative, and to a large extent, Mr Scott, you've answered the first part of my question in your earlier answer, which my question is, um, have frontline services been maintained at pre-reform levels? In terms of the, obviously we've, you've, we've got to look at the change situation and uh, basically obviously the, the focus uh, from the, the border's point of view is both local and specialist and we're very well aware that nationally we've seen our real coming together in terms of specialist services and, and as Mr Jones has pointed out, um, the, when we've had serious issues around uh, serious crime, we've, we've been able to get attract that specialist support in. Also for things like the, the Merlewood Sevens and events like that. So when we've needed that specialist resource, it, it, it's, 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 come, it's come in. Uh, with regard to uh, more, more the, the, the local response, yeah, I, I, the, obviously there's been resource change, but in terms of the outcome focus we have, in terms of our police uh, and fire and rescue plans, etc., we, 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 uh, we, we have been holding the police to account uh, and uh, Fire and Rescue Service uh, to account with regard to the various, various outcomes. Uh, obviously, there's a difference between the Fire and Rescue Service and the police because the Fire and Rescue Service have fire stations uh, across the borders and also both a mixture of full-time and retained staff. Uh, the police, uh, obviously, it's a, a different approach from them, but we have, uh, we've been, we have tried to hold the police uh, uh, account, uh, uh, accountable for uh, outcomes in the borders, and we feel that uh, over the, the last period we have we have maintained that uh, going going forward. But we do recognise that there, there has been resource change. Okay, thank you, Mr. Jones. Um, Chair, if, if I may, um, I think one of the, the advantages of <clears throat> the National Service is the volume of information that's available to do you know, comparisons between different local authority areas, and certainly the police uh, quarterly report that they publish on their website, which is open to anybody to view, contains a lot of detail around the crime rates, what those crime different cat uh, categories, categories consist of what the detection rate is like, what the rate of crime per 10,000 of the population and that kind of thing. So I think that's an, a, a particular advantage where in the past you probably weren't so aware of how you looked in comparison to other perhaps similar areas for your um, sort of families of councils. And it's certainly, certainly a document that I use a lot personally because if we're going to do intervention activity, it needs to be kind of evidence-led. In my view, we don't have lots of resources that we can putting in lots of different things without having some kind of analytical support, um, analytical evidence to support what we're proposing to do. And certainly, whilst the, the scrutiny reports on particular matters in relation to the police and fire plans for the local area, I think that piece of information that's on the Police Scotland website allows you to get into the detail of it and really understand what the different categories of crime are, you know, what the trends and things like that are, because it's on a quarterly basis. You can compare last year to this year and so on and so forth. So I think that's certainly one of the advantages that I've seen, which helps to kind of work out, actually, are you um, in a different place than other parts of Scotland? Are you much the same? And what is the reasoning behind that? So you understand what you're trying to achieve in relation to what the analytical picture is telling you. Okay. And uh, that sort of brings me on to my next question, which was what um, a effect has national policy had on local services or, or, or local communities. I'm thinking perhaps armed police and you know some of the, the big decisions that are taken. And do you feel that there's enough local consultation on that? Um, well, if I may answer, yes. um, certainly within the Safe Communities team, we've got, we're integrated. So we've got police officers, fire service officers, our alcohol and drugs partnership and our community safety team, which principally consists of staff who are involved with supporting victims of domestic abuse but also our kind of antisocial, antisocial behaviour team. And within that, which I suppose is the kind of core of it, we have a couple of analysts that do all the analytical work for us. So I suppose we, uh, within our Safer Communities team and our planning process, what we try to do is bring together the content or, or bits of the our local community plan, our police and fire plans, our alcohol and drug partnership plan, and any other things that have a more, um, you know, whilst they may have national 
significance, for example, equally safe for domestic abuse, and then try and localise that so it's much more geared up towards our local circumstances. And that's where having the analytical information is really important because it allows you to get a better understanding of where we are in relation to what the strategy of the plans kind of what it's asking you to do and then how that translates into what the local picture is like mm -hmm. and our performance information and the way we report and as I, I kind of mentioned earlier on around the uh, our oversight group that we hold monthly all that is to try and put a much more local perspective on the delivery of service so you can have something that's um, you know uh, kind of quite high level in the language that we use but what we want to do is convert that into local delivery so, for example, the, um, if you take the, the collision targets around ser killed and seriously injured people, what we've done there is, yeah, there's an enforcement component to that, but actually we've looked at who are the kind of core groups, who are the most vulnerable in our roads. So the over 65s tend to be a vulnerable group, so we've done intervention work around them, doing kind of inputs across the borders and offering them a a refresher drive with a driving instructor just to kind of bring their driving skills up to scratch. We've got a, a, a newly qualified driver's course that we uh, are supported by the Institute of Advanced Motorists. And we also do um, a number of sessions for those young people that are just on the cusp of getting their provisional license to try and try to influence their behavior, but also influence their behavior of their passenger in a car. Uh, with another young person. So there's lots of different things that we do. So adapt the national policy to suit your local needs, is that? Basically. Yeah, that, that's fine. Um, can I just ask how many policy analysts you have in, in your case? Uh, well, it, it, there, we've got, a, we've got um, two. So we've got one that deals with, it's principally for antisocial behaviour. So they're uh, information and statistics officers. So they're actually a police employee. And then we've got another analyst who's a council employee and she does the uh, preparation, for example, for the scrutiny reports that we've got. She does the analysis for the uh, oversight group that we run monthly. She provides, um, you know, youth bulletins. So she provides all the analytical support mm -hmm. uh, in collaboration with the information and statistics okay. officer. Thank you. That's interesting. Can I just ask Mr. Ruth Jones um, if you can sort of relate that question to the Fire and Rescue Service about I mean, national in, policy? Yeah, in, yeah. In, in, in two parts, if I can. With regards to the resources element, I think it's been uh, well publicised um, that there have been no station closures. You know, what started off um, with uh, 356 is still 356. And the way that the, um, the, you know, the service positions itself within the community, obviously it is very much under the new legislation and so forth, very much front and centre now, I believe, of the community um, delivery of, 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 of safety and so forth. I think the, um, the service from the uh, work that we have done has shown that the uh, Community Empowerment Act and the roles and responsibilities have been really taken forward with regards uh, to the service and they've even sort of very much now part of the development of, of community planning response and the whole element of developing that as well as within their transformational um, agenda. And I suppose some of that is they've really embedded themselves into the communities. Uh, I think that the legislation bringing uh, a requirement for a local senior officer there has made it far more localised but obviously with a, a direction from the service itself. Obviously at the beginning there was a requirement to bring things into the centre to ensure that there was a common approach across the whole of Scotland uh, but now those reins are being released and we're recognising that and so they're very much now involved in the local planning process whereas before it was very much a template and we're really really pleased to see that and we were able to report that within some of our uh, some of our sort of findings on the local air inspections we've done. But things like, you know, the local uh, liaison officers now are embedded in some of the councils, so they are right there uh, to be able to deal with things. There are secondees in some of the, the housing associations, particularly in Glasgow. So they're really into the, the nitty-gritty of um, delivering a, um, a community-safe um, environment for the whole of Scotland. Okay. Thank you. Liam MacArthur. 
I'm just interested in Mr Jones's description of um, the, the, the type of engagement you've had, I think both on the fire side and the police side, but um, it, it struck me as you were, you were speaking there that um, a recent experience I had a, at a local level was in relation to um, uh, taser training and deployment um, of officers. And while we received a briefing about the national picture and, and, and the rationale behind it, which I think um, we all understood, um, there was descriptions of a 3%, I think it was, um, deployment across the country. What wasn't made clear was the, the local implications of that. And, and within Orkney, it soon became apparent that the numbers that were going to need to be trained um, were significantly uh, higher than, than that. And uh, I know that the elected members on the um, police board there were somewhat taken aback um, by, by the figures. And it suggested that the engagement about the rationale for doing this at a national level, people understood the, 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 um, the rationale for doing it at a local level, I, I don't think was as well understood. And I'm, I'm just curious whether on that particular issue you felt that the engagement you had about um, uh, the, needs, the needs case um, was uh, was as robust as it as it might be if you'd always had line of sight about the, the number of officers that would be um, going through the the, the taser training um, was was adequate from from the perspective of yourself and indeed elected members. Um, so, well, certainly from my own perspective, it, it was raised at one of our um, scrutiny meetings a mm -hmm. few months ago, and the rationale was put across. I don't think anybody there um, had a particular strong view that that wasn't a, a credible argument in case. I suppose, as far as numbers are concerned, certainly from the police service, they're, they're providing a 24-7 service, 365 days a year, and they need to build into that resilience. So I think whilst if you were if you were talking about an eight-hour day, Monday to Friday, the number probably looks quite large. Uh, and I can't remember offhand what the number for the Scottish borders actually was. Um, but if you're then extending that across a 24-hour period, building in rest days and all that kind of thing, you need a critical mass to provide a sufficiency of operational cover. And clearly there's no point in, in introducing something if you've not actually got um, the right resource at the right time in the right place when you actually need it. But I think so, on this, I, I, I mean, the needs case at a national level in terms of increased threat levels and, and all the rest of it, I think, was, was fairly well under, yeah. understood. I think at a more, more localised level, was there ever a debate about um, a change in, in threat levels that necessitated that rollout at a local level that matched what was um, deemed to be necessary um, at, a, at a national level? Um, I th I th it's a while ago since it was actually raised, so right. I can't remember that exact um, basis of the discussion, but I think there was a view that, um, that you know, there was a, a kind of a credible need. And certainly, I, I mean, I suppose speaking from my previous occupation, hmm. um, when I was involved in that kind of work, and you had a, a something that took place in the borders, you know, clearly time can be quite a critical component. And actually having some sort of resource locally based because it's not whilst the borders yes it's a relatively low crime rate and violent crime is thankfully relatively low there are occasions when you need to have those kind of special resources and may need them pretty quickly to deal with a particular incident so um, i suppose there was acknowledgement that yes we may not have the profile like some of the big urban areas but nevertheless you know something can develop out of very little and you need to have the ability to deal with that. And I think that the, the kind of taser argument, because they're probably a more, uh, for, for, for the circumstances that you potentially could find yourself in, they're probably a more flexible um, uh, tactical option than some of the more conventional firearm um, equipment. I, mean, I appreciate I've slightly ambushed you. I mean, if there are further thoughts or observations you yeah. want to share with the committee, I'd certainly welcome that, okay. but that's helpful. Yeah, could I just confirm, Mr. Jones? Um, are you are you um, confident that when a national decision is taken, you consulted in advance of that decision being taken, or are there circumstances where you you're reactive and you go to your scrutiny panel and you say, "Well, how are we going to manage this?" I think Mr. Scott's probably better yeah. Um, yeah. able to answer. I think uh, basically at the scrutiny board. 
uh, the local police commander and also the local fire and rescue commander go through the various things which happen nationally. And, you know, uh, obviously, you know, we've, we've gone through a process early on that there, there were some things, you know, like police counters, etc., where we could have done with more extensive consultation. But we've got into a process now where we, make, we uh, have indicated very strongly we need to be aware of these things. So we discuss these things uh, through, through that uh, in the initial presentation from the local police commander and fire and rescue commander at, at our meetings. So basically, we feel that we've got a, a, a into a position now where we get early warning of, of things through that work. And indeed, we uh, as a board uh, have been at the forefront of ensuring that we have uh, close national and local relations. And that's really led to the Police Scrutiny Conveners Forum, for example, which is meeting today in Glasgow through the work in COSLA. And uh, so we feel that uh, we have now uh, got into a position where we are getting early warning of everything coming down the line. So there's no surprises. So we're able uh, to, to work together uh, to uh, work through solutions and react to, to issues. Yeah, so the point is you're able to influence the, the, the decision uh, through the consultation. Um, Liam MacArthur has just asked his question, so Liam Kerr. Thank you, Vina. Good morning, panel. Uh, I'd like to follow on from Rona Mackay's question around policy. Uh, insofar as one criticism of centralisation, uh, it might be that overall policy and budgetary control is held very much centrally. Uh, so do any of you have any views on whether there would be benefit derived from devolving some aspects of policy, some aspects of budgetary control to the local police com commanders or the senior fire officers uh, to directly improve their local services? Shall I, shall I kick yes, off please. with that? Um, I think as I've already sort of expressed, the, um, there was rightly a need to bring things more central to start with, to be able to understand where the variants were and trying to have a, stand, a standard approach. Um, but I think that as time goes by and there is needs to be a more local delivery element, then I think with that, naturally, my personal view is that with that needs to be a lot more autonomy within the, um, within the local senior officers um, element. And obviously some of that will come with budgets. But there is a risk there that you could then start um, moving out towards having uh, a number of single in inverted commas fire services if you're not too careful so it's a careful balance it's a um, it's a discussion which isn't for me it's for the the management board and for the, the, the chief fire officer but I do believe that there is a need to release the reins um, if you truly want community safety um, and delivery across the whole of Scotland I'll come back to that if I may in a second but uh, I think Scott. this is an evolving process and, you, and you certainly, if you look at both the uh, Scottish Borders local police plan and also the community fire and rescue plan, you'll see that we're getting into things like looking at strategic assessments, looking at consultations with local communities, partners, and really we're evolving uh, as we go along because the issues that we're looking at, uh, you think I mentioned earlier on about take the police, you know, we're working together now very closely on things like domestic abuse. We're doing a, we've got a unit which Mr Jones looks after. It's a very successful unit in tackling, tackling domestic abuse, which from a rural point of view has been game-changing. Uh, we are working together in terms of road safety, uh, antisocial behaviour, uh, also the violent crime linked into uh, both counter-terrorism and serious organised crime, and also in terms of alcohol abuse, and I mentioned earlier on protecting people. And also, uh, and, and that is getting us into very close working. It links into the co-located co work that, again, it's been worked through with uh, through Mr Jones. And you can see in the fire and rescue side, the link in again to the community planning themes and this wider uh, sort of approach that's being taken. So I, I think that we're in an evolving situation. I think uh, as time goes on, we'll be able to, the, the, the issue about resources may come and it, it may be an ad, a, a good addition, but uh, we need to, uh, I, th I think we're seeing this evolving as we go, go ahead. And I think we're seeing a lot of progressive things happening because of that. 
So, Mr. Scott, do I take from that that you would agree with Mr. Rice Jones that uh, there would be benefit in devolving policy and budgetary control to a more I th I think local level? That, I think uh, there's a, there's a case for looking at that, but I've got the same issue in terms of risk. We've, we've got to ensure that the specialists, resources, etc., are there because we're different in changing times. We need a new technology now, much more sophisticated approaches uh, to to crime, and I think we've got to be aware of that changing situation. And people are more mobile as well. We're seeing people in the Borders, working in Edinburgh, etc. You know, and people. Are, uh, so really, it's very much a much more mobile, mobile world, world. And so we need to take all that into consideration. But I think there is a direction of travel that needs to look at uh, 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 devolution. And if I may stay with you, Mr. Scott, the um, following on, you may, in a roundabout way, have answered this question. The, the final policy intention of the. Uh, the Act was to strengthen the connection between the police and fire service and the local communities and the elected representatives. Do I take it from your previous answer that your view is that that has been achieved, and if so, to what extent? Uh, completely, or could, well, could there be more? Uh, put it this way, I think, it's an, as I said to you, an evolving situation. We've done a lot, and I think I've, I've been, been trying to sort of make the point that really we, we've got a lot of initiatives going, and I think we need to develop that much further in terms of early prevention and, pre and prevention. So, uh, as, as I say, it, I think it's work in hand, and, and, and I think we've so far Far, I think we're making quite a, quite a lot of progress and certainly the work we're doing in terms of locality work, we're doing locality planning now, working with both fire and rescue and police, I think that will be an important important point as well. So I, I'm, what I'm really saying is that uh, it, it's, a move, it's, a, it's, it's moving forward and uh, we, we just have to, and we need to look at what's possible in terms of, of, of devolution. Mr. Rice Jones, do you agree? Yeah, my, um, I suppose my response originally to you was around the finance, and I think that's where I, you know, where you came from originally. Mm. Uh, with regards to policy, um, certainly, as I mentioned earlier, there, uh, there now needs to be a releasing of the reins with regards to it, and I think it's right and proper that um, where the services have a, a different need within the community, then there will be a need for a different policy. But I think there will be mainstream policies, and there will be um, within the local plans some need for some slight variance of that but that needs to be very carefully handled and managed so that it doesn't uh, go off like topsy. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but do you believe that the, the act or the, the impact of the act has strengthened the, the connections so thus far uh, in terms of between the elected representatives and the local communities? Uh, absolutely. Um, yeah, as I said right from the start, I think that the service now, uh, it was to a degree, but it's absolutely embedded now within the community and with the local authorities and so forth, and working hand in hand. They are forming part of the community plans, uh, which are the risk areas within those particular communities. Thank you. Keith okay. Fulton. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Uh, good morning, panel. The, you've talked to me a bit about the... Um, the Safer Communities Board, and, uh, and I know that it has um, held up as a model of best practice. Could you elaborate a wee bit further on what the composition of the board is? I know you touched on it earlier that, that yourself, Graham Jones and Douglas Scott are on it, but can you elaborate a bit more on the, the composition? OK, well, from the very beginning, uh, what we uh, wanted to do was look at having a, you know, a, a wide approach to this. So we have members from the Council, both elected members from both the administration and the opposition. Uh, and also we have representatives from key partners, uh, NHS Borders, Scottish Borders House Network, which is, represents the registered social landlords who are very involved in um, uh, tackling antisocial behaviour and community safety. Uh, also the voluntary sector, uh, and they have a big role to play in terms of community safety and also the, the business sector as well. So it consists of six council members and four representatives, and it's chaired by uh, the, 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 the council. In, that, in the case, it's Councillor Turnbull, George Turnbull, who, who chairs it, uh, and it meets on a quarterly basis. And we very much take a consensus approach to decision making. And it's very much uh, an advisor, advises the, the council. And I think the huge strength, as I mentioned, it was based when it came together. We had the, a co the co-located uh, community safety unit behind that. So that's given a real uh, boost to that. And apart from looking at police and fire and rescue issues, we widened it to look at uh, community safety as a whole uh, through the, the work that Mr. Jones does. So we've got a, a very holistic take 
on the way forward. So uh, we look at the police and fire performance, how that, that how that's going. We look, look at national issues. We look at uh, the police and fire from performance, but we also then go on to look at uh, particular issues, things like uh, we've had we have, we've had presentations on things like rural crime, uh, wildlife crime, uh, also things like community justice. Road safety. We've looked at the Coast Guard service, looked at other services as well to see how they might link in. Link, link in. And from that, there's been real support for a whole range of uh, community initiatives around uh, driver awareness, motorbike safety, things like water safety, uh, prevention of alcohol and drugs, also uh, it, uh, um, tackling domestic abuse and violence against women and rural crime, and the rural crime is, uh, has involved uh, work with farmers, and that's also included the Fire and Rescue Service as well in terms of safety, and we've had really good plaudits from, from that work. So we feel that it's certainly what we've tried to do is very, get, get very, uh, have very close working uh, with the Police and Fire and Rescue Services and with our elected members. We've also had visits as well uh, to uh, fire stations, uh, and also, we've been three times now uh, uh, to um, the, the police control centre uh, uh, to look at the, how they handle call, the, the calls at Bilson Glen, and, and that's been very successful as well, taking people to actually see, the elected members to see, and the partners to see what's happening there. Yeah, I was going to ask you about um, how the, the specific mix on um, your board um, allows you to deal with the issues. And you, uh, the two I was going to ask about were domestic abuse and missing people. I think you've You've referred to domestic abuse here, and, and it's obvious you, you feel the, yep. the, the, the board uh, that you've got just now has helped you to identify ways to deal with that. What, what, what about uh, missing people, an area I'm interested in, in the Parliament here as well? How's, does the current mix, and I suppose as a, a supplementary on that so, so you can answer it together, it would be if you, you were to be tackling an issue and there was another uh, organisation or service that you felt would be beneficial, how would they get themselves on to that board? Would they be invited? or? <coughs> I suppose what Mr Scott's kind of referred to is the, the scrutiny board and, and I, I suppose if there was additional um, members being invited in that would be a, I suppose a, a conversation um, between Mr Scott and the chair. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, what I kind of alluded to earlier was our kind of monthly uh, oversight group which is nine elected members uh, that attend that. Um, some are also members of the scrutiny board that we've got mm -hmm. that meets quarterly. Uh, and we've got a number of uh, um, council officers and the police attend that. So I think the two things sort of really complement each other. So one component's around the scrutiny part, and the other's about looking at what are the issues, both in relation to what we're identifying through analysis, but also what are elected members bringing to the table as specific constituency concerns. And what we try and do is kind of, I suppose, marry the two things up and then get some kind of consensus of agreement about the, the kind of priorities for the forthcoming month, which tie into what's in the community plan and what's in the police plan as well, so that we're not off, you know, there's, a, I suppose, a, a, a clear um, sort of linear structure that we're kind of working within, that we're not kind of off deviating across different things. But I think the two things kind of complement each other. And whilst we've only had that oversight group since kind of April of this year, we're going to review the, the composition of it in December and because I think there's an opportunity to put a bit of breadth into it. For example, the fire service should probably be at the table and there's a couple of others that I have in mind I think should also be there because when you start looking at some of these problems, they're not one dimensional. And I think this, the, the, it's not a, a law, necessarily a law enforcement problem. It could well be that um, you know, our registered social landlords have got a role to play in that or neighbourhood services from the police side or if we were getting deliberate fires, for example, it might be something the fire service could support with. So I think at the minute it was to get the thing kind of going, but now we've actually got ourselves into a kind of natural cycle with it. There's an opportunity to put a bit of breadth, and clearly if we if we felt there was an organisation or something that could support that, we could either bring them in on a kind of short-term basis or invite them in as a sort of longer-term member. And pick up on on a part. Um, you know, we talked about the involvement um, of the fire service in other areas, and we've just recently done an inspection of the Highlands. And uh, what they've done there is they've devolved the community planning elements into eight local areas, and the. Um, 
senior officers of group manager and the, the LSO up there actually chair two of those uh, committees. And they're not necessarily fire related, they are within all the other challenges within a community. So what I'm trying to really sort of uh, indicate here is that they are very much integrated into the community to deal with, very much picking up on what Mr Jones was saying, um, the, the cross-referencing of risk across the community and they're able to chair um, other areas other than fire. And certainly the, the feedback that I, I've had was they've expressed how effective the, the service has in performing, in leading the local community um, within their chairmanship. Jenny. Thank you, Convener. Um, we've covered local scrutiny in, in some depth this morning already, but um, it does seem to be the case that in the borders anyway, it's working well. I wonder perhaps if you might be able to share with the committee what happened prior to reform in the borders with regard to local scrutiny and how it compares, obviously, to the, the current status. Well, personally, I, I wasn't very close to that because I've just been, in, uh, been involved with the, the, the local scrutiny arrangements that we've set up in the Scottish borders. But before that, uh, it was part, we were part of Lothian and, and, and Borders, um, both police and fire and rescue boards, and uh, and and I, I don't have that input, I don't have that uh, knowledge. Okay, Graham Jones, do you? Um, well, I was actually a member of Lothian and Borders Police, right. uh, and I've been a member of Police Scotland uh, before I joined Scottish Borders Council. So I suppose um, my I didn't actually work in the Scottish Borders either in either force, but um, I did work in West Lothian, I did work in Edinburgh, mm -hmm. so I suppose in, in West Lothian, um, the arrangements, I think, had started to move towards what looks kind of now like the scrutiny arrangements, so we did have, um, uh, uh, I suppose, a kind of scrutiny, but it wasn't called a scrutiny panel, but mm -hmm. essentially the divisional commander and other senior police officers go along with the fire service. And, and members of the council would kind of scrutinise around performance. It wasn't just police performance, it, it deviated into areas uh, of social work and education and those mm -hmm. sorts of things. So I think, I think it, certainly from my point of view, it was quite a good stepping stone between where we were then uh -huh. and where we've come to now. Um, but notwithstanding that, there was clearly the old police boards, um, which I only ever personally attended once. And I think that whilst there was... Um, you know, representatives from the different councils there and those cross-party elected members. It was, it was, I suppose, having direct interaction with the Chief Constable mm -hmm. at that time, so you probably weren't getting into the detail mm -hmm. necessarily that I think you're able to now. Yeah. Um, you know, because obviously we've got the divisional commander, but we've got other senior police officers and the fire officers come as well. Mm -hmm. So you, you're actually concentrating on one particular area rather mm -hmm. than a kind of a scaled-up version of that where you're perhaps touching at the some areas but not lots whereas I think now we can get in much more into the minutiae of what's actually taken place and I suppose if I could refer back to uh, my comments earlier about the availability of performance information from ac across the country for each of the 32 local authorities there's a lot of, there's a really kind of rich picture in getting a good understanding of you know how the borders is positioned in relation to other parts of the country what are the things that are affecting us but perhaps aren't affecting other areas or you know do we need to kind of put more of an effort in it, certain things rather than others and, and things like that so I think from my point of view yeah, it has provided a much more uh, localized uh, understanding because clearly the police would understand the business but not necessarily other I suppose kind of key partners yeah. not in the same way and I think it's probably in my view has achieved that. Thank you, that's very helpful. Um, Simon Jones, I'd like to go back to the point that you made, sorry, uh, with regard to local liaison officers, because you said they're now embedded in some of the councils. Do you have any idea how many of the councils they're embedded in? And does HMI have a view with regard to good practice in terms of whether or not that should be happening par for the course across the country? Uh, I can't answer with regards to the first part because okay. we haven't covered all of the areas um, within our local area inspections, but we have come across a number that have uh, been embedded with regards to the, um, you know, my view with regards to it, I think it absolutely is a, um, an area 
that could be um, developed. Mm -hmm. I think it's far, far better to have um, a single um, unit of, of um, cross-reference of, um, of organisations within one room mm -hmm. uh, that can meet on a regular basis and, and brush ideas and, and thoughts across each other on a regular basis. So, to, in, in short, yes, I think it's a very good idea. OK, thank you. That concludes our, our questioning. Can I thank all the witnesses for attending? That's been a very encouraging evidence session. And we'll now suspend to allow for a change of witnesses. I welcome our second panel today on our scrutiny of the Police and Fire Reform Act, Kate Frame, Commissioner John McSporran, Head of Investigations, and Michael Tate, Head of Communications with Police Investigation and Review Commissioner. Um, also, Diego Kioris, 
hopefully that's right. <laughs> and I thank the witnesses for their, um, oh, I should say who is the Scottish Human Rights Commission from, the, from there. Um, can I thank the witnesses for their written evidence, which is so helpful to the committee in advance of you appearing before us today. We'll now move straight to questions as our witnesses are content, I understand, not to make an opening statement. So starting with Liam Kerr. Good morning. Uh, we heard from the SPA in written evidence that, the, uh, that it puts information in the public domain in response to queries about the information that the park publishes, but its preference would be to have a confidential process. Would that be the park's preference as well? And if so, uh, what measures are you taking to ensure confidentiality? For experience last year, uh, we too agree that there should be confidentiality around the process and, like the SPA, have determined that in future we will not normally provide uh, comment on the senior officer misconduct investigations. We've adapted our policy um, to that effect. So you've adapted the policy, so that's in place now, that, that is going forward how it's it going is. to be. Uh, the park is enabled to review non-criminal complaints uh, about the police once they've gone through Police Scotland's complaints process. Uh, and it, a concern has been expressed by the park uh, about the amount of complaints that are being referred. Could you explain that in a bit more depth and why do you see it as a matter of concern? I suppose it comes down to the independence of the process. Um, I have concerns in relation to the level of police discretion which continues uh, to allow them to investigate some of their own actions. I think there are three categories um, which I have identified uh, that um, that discretion is extended in. The first would be at the recording stage, the second in what they interpret as serious incidents, and the third would be in relation to investigating um, both on and off duty criminality. So unpicking those separately and individually at the recording stage, obviously there is significant discretion uh, afforded to the police at that time. How a complaint is initially recorded uh, by the police will generally determine the route that it then takes. Uh, recently, we've seen some evidence of serious criminal allegations which have been inappropriately recorded. Uh, we have examples of a complaint uh, where someone had been unlawfully detained uh, that was recorded by the police as a quality of service complaint. There's another example of an allegation of rape, which was um, recorded by the police as a quality of... Sorry, that was recorded as incivility. There was a further example of someone who had been punched twice on the face. That was recorded by the police as excessive force rather than as assault. So in all of those cases, the only reason and the only way where in which we found out uh, effectively about how the recording process had uh, taken place was because the complainers had, they had made a complaint to the police which had been dealt with, they felt dissatisfied and they came to us seeking a complaint handling review. At that stage, we were able to refer the matter to Crown Office for their instructions in relation to the criminality involved. So had, had the complainers not had the option of coming through the complaint handling process, we would have been none the wiser, and uh, they would have uh, continued down that line. The second uh, area relates to uh, serious incidents, and obviously in terms of Section 41B of the Act the, and the regulations, the Chief Constable must refer serious incidents to me. That has afforded some discretion around the police interpretation of what is a serious in incident, uh, particularly around serious injuries. We've seen instances uh, where the police have actually advised a complainer to go to the hospital uh, following an injury which they have sustained in the course of an arrest. Um, the, the view taken was that that was not a serious injury, take it into the serious incident in terms of Section 41B, so the police did not refer it to me. And uh, the, the person went off to hospital, was found to have a fusion to the bone rather than a fracture to their arm. And uh, again, that came to us by way of the complaint handling review process. Um, 
Again, there are issues which touch on the, the Human Rights Commission submission here in relation to um, serious incidents. And one suggestion might be that in place of the term serious incident as it is in the legislation, in view of the recent, or it's actually over a few years now, the, the level or the threshold for what is a serious incident as regarded by the European Court of Human Rights, we may have come to a point that it would be appropriate to, instead of saying serious incident in terms of the current legislation, to replace that with an inference of a potential breach of Article 2 and 3. And again, um, yes, Mr. Kiaras. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, first of all, for inviting us to, to um, this evidence. Um, can I touch upon two issues? One is the confidentiality that the, the, the member mentioned before, and the other one is, is the serious incident. So um, there are a number of um, requirements that the, the European Court of Human Rights has um, developed through jurisprudence, jurisprudence and, and this is what is, is, is um, known as uh, positive obligations. And those positive obligations, as the committee knows very well, are procedu procedural in, in character. Um, and, and those for, for effective investigations are um, that the investigation has to be independent, effective, prompt, open to a public scrutiny, and involve the victims or the victim's um, a family where the victim, when, when the victim is deceased. And um, I think it's very important to, to say that uh, these requirements of Article 2 and Article 3 and even Article 8 um, have not been reflected either in the or neither in the in the in the act or the regulations, and so just going back to your point of confidentiality, and I think confidentiality is is is, is crucial and central to the process, but also the the principle of open to public scrutiny is is equally relevant in terms of um, procedures and decision making that should be not only open but transparent in order to uh, ensure accountability. So just to give you an example, the regulations and the act give the pair discretion to decide whether to investigate serious incidents or matters in the public in interest, and that discretion, of course, is understandable. That said, it's equally important that the pair decision-making process is open, transparent, objective, and independent to ensure accountability and public confidence. Therefore, uh, our recommendation is that there should be a requirement that the PERC gives reasons, at least to those affected, for a, for a decision not to investigate any serious an incident involving a person serving with the police or a matter in the public interest, as both are defined in the Act and the regulations. So that's, that's the, the, again, the balance between confidence and, and, and public and open to the public scrutiny. In relation to serious incidents, um, yes, Regulation 6 or 7, for instance, could be revised along the light of this ECH, uh, the convention requirements that I just mentioned. Um, the chief constable or the SPA with the discretion, that have the discretion to whether or not refer these circumstances to the commissioner for independent investigation. And it's this clear that those incidents um, might be low in, in some circumstances, and uh, might be uh, not frequent, but the point here is that they have the potential to engage Article 3 um, and Article 8. So in these circumstances, legal obligations to investigate might arise and it's not a matter of option. And the, the, the point um, very well made by the commissioner is that the, the convention, as, as you know, is a living instrument. So human rights are um, evolutive in character. Therefore, the threshold of Article 2, 3, and Article 8 is not as high as it was before. So what is considered a serious incident, or no, what it was considered a serious incident in 2012, it might not be the case that it's a serious incident. Uh, it's, it, it's not a serious incident today. Uh, thank you for that. The, uh, if I could put another question to Commissioner, um, but Mr. Kiaroth, if you come in, if I uh, see it relevant. Uh, I understand the problem. I, I think you've articulated that very clearly. In terms of a solution, uh, so Commissioner, one of the things you've proposed is to replace 
the serious incident. Is not another solution to take the discretion away from where it currently sits and perhaps have an independent organisation or some other organisation that, at least in terms of transparency, uh, would be independently making these decisions? Yes, I would agree that that would be the gold standard and it would make entire sense for there to be a, a completely independent process to increase uh, transparency around the, the scrutiny of um, incidents that fall within Article 2, 3, uh, criminal, criminality, etc. Um, because currently I do think that there is a fundamental issue about transparency. Yes. Thank you. Um, I think the, the key issue is that the, both the, the legislation, the Act, and the, and the regulations fail to mention uh, the convention requirements, Article 2, 3, and 8. And, and, and this is, I think this, this is um, the, the, the key issue. And how this can be solved in terms of solution, as you're saying, well, you, you can qualify that discretion in, in the Act. So you can say that uh, the NC is cover, covered by Article, uh, by Regulation 6 or 7. Um, require a qualified discretion on whether the inc incidents uh, uh, are, should be referred to the commissioner and are exercised in line with convention rights. So you, you modify the, 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 the text, the current text, and you add those uh, articles and, 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 and convention requirements. I understand. Thank you. Okay. Done. So, I mean, my, my questions really follow directly on from that. And I have to say, I'm, I'm quite disturbed by some of the things that you have stated. I, I, I mean, do I hear you correctly saying that rape and assault were recorded as um, service, quality of service and incivility? Uh, that, can, can I maybe yes, ask I you to just confirm that yes. and, 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 and more importantly comment on what is going on there? Is that competence, just a, a clerical error, or is it something more uh, s uh, disturbing and, or, or, or indeed untoward than that? Well, I can first of all confirm that in relation to the example I gave of unlawful detention, that was recorded as a quality of service. In relation to an allegation of rape, that was recorded as incivility. We were surprised equally when we received that through the complaint handling process. Um, I think there may be a combination of factors uh, that have contributed to it, either by the way of incompetence or other more sinister aspects. I mean, the police subcommittee in February uh, of this year received evidence from uh, Chief Constable Mike Barton investigating the Police Counter Corruption Unit. Mm -hmm. And he, he said that uh, he was very frustrated in his investigations, mm -hmm. which he he, he put at, 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 at the, the hands or, or, or of uh, incompetence, but, but also a degree, a high degree of defensiveness, especially from the legal department within Police Scotland. I mean, are, would you share that view? I mean, is this what we are seeing in some of these circumstances in particular? I, I note from your evidence where you talk about inappropriate use of uh, attempts to uh, seek frontline resolution in terms of the, 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 the non-criminal complaints, which you consider would be appropriate for you to investigate? Yes, I, I think part of the challenge is that frontline resolution encourages uh, an immediate resolution that does not always satisfy the complainer. Uh, because we have quite a few examples where people go in to make quite serious complaints and they try to resolve it locally. But I'm not sure that you should be resolving a serious complaint locally. That I think it needs to progress to an investigation, whether that be a full investigation within the police as a complaint, or whether, if it involves Article 2 and 3, it then moves onwards to ourselves. But I'm not sure that you should be trying to resolve serious allegations locally through frontline resolution. I do think that it needs to move up the, sort of, the ladder as to how it is investigated or processed. So I believe a colleague wants to ask a bit more detail, but I'd just like to come back to, I mean, how widespread do you think this may be? You, 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 you stated that 
you're sort of finding these out by accident because people are asking for review of the police internal you know, complaints handling. Do you have any sense of how significant an issue this is? No, and it's very difficult to assess that because it only is if uh, the complainers come to us after the event. Right. And some may very well not. If I could come in on that. It's, it's the old adage, you only know what you know. That if you cannot examine it, you cannot tell the extent of the problem. And at present, there is no audit of those sort of processes to determine the extent of the problem. Now, the problem might be small and there might be a few isolated examples, but unless you can actually look at the, the extent of the problem, how do you tell whether wholesale change is necessary or <coughs> what thresholds to set? Yeah, if, if I may, just uh, very, very quickly. I think the, the, the importance to modify or, or amend legislation um, in terms of human rights issue, and stop there, and, and, and probably this highlight the, the issue of, of human rights cascading or a human rights-based approach to policing, cascading down to, to, to constables. Um, so I, I think what this highlights is the, the, the lack of adequate training and guidance, which should be accompanied by, by the, a clear understanding of those uh, obligations, Article 2, 3, 8, and positive obligations, and does apply equally to of course, to, to the police forces to understand uh, the decision-making process and, 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 and the results of those, of those decisions that they take in terms of those obligations, but as well, uh, I would say, in, in terms of, of, of PERC. So, so just the final question in terms of alternatives, and you've already stated that the, the possibility of, of having a completely independent uh, body to, to oversee all complaint handling, well, first of all, can I ask, is that, is, is that essentially you, you making the suggestion that, 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 part, that you, know, you as the commissioner and, 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 and corporately should have that, that role? And, and short of that, is there scope to do um, sort of secondary re reviews, i.e. giving you the ability to, to sort of open up any particular case, perhaps do uh, random samples or, or desk-based reviews or, or approaches like that. I, I'd be interested in hearing if you think either those are good ideas or, or indeed that there are, there are, there are others. Uh, but I mean, ultimately, are you saying that you, know, you, you as the park should triage complaints and decide uh, to, to hand over back to the police uh, rather than them deciding to hand over to you? I think we would be well placed to do that. Uh, I'm not calling for that to come to PERC as an organisation. Uh, however, I do recognise that having already gained the expertise and, and uh, the body of experience that we have, it would perhaps make sense. I appreciate that that kind of model would be a huge transformation um, of the police complaints oversight system in Scotland, but perhaps that change is in fact necessary in the new environment. Um, just to ensure public confidence uh, and ensure we have a police complaint system that seem to be independent and fair. Um, an essential component, as you've said, uh, would be to ensure a proportional approach to that. Uh, and I, I would see that there, there could be a role in, as you've suggested, triaging, that whilst we may um, have a role in receiving a uh, recording and then directing the complaints out to the appropriate organisation, that may be a solution. Thank you. Maybe to put this, um, the scale of the problem in, in context a little bit, I, I note that from 2016-17 data, it appears that PERC is asked to review the handling of less than 5% of the complaints made about the, the police, um, and accordingly most complaints are not subject to any independent oversight. Um, so Police Scotland failing to do this and this 95% is clearly a very worrying figure. Can you comment on, on you know, what can be done? Well, that could be viewed another way and it could be mm -hmm. that perhaps Police Scotland are improving their complaints handling process and a smaller proportion of the complainers are coming to us. But I'm not in a position to come down on either side of that argument, um, but I, I'm presenting the alternative version to that. Yeah. 
Um, and again, I suppose it comes back down to the, the model that uh, Mr Johnson has referred to about complaints coming into one independent organisation with a view to triaging them out mm -hmm. to the appropriate recipients. So without knowing all the facts, that would seem to cover the, the problem and get over any, um, any perception that the police might not want to pass over certain ones. Yeah, I okay. think so. That's helpful. Um, I think we're back to Liam Kerr. I'm not convinced you are convinced. <laughs> <laughs> well, in that case, um, can I ask, the 2012 Act provides the potential for the PERC to inv investigate any circumstances in which there's an indication that a serving police officer has committed a crime and they're concerned that there have been incidents where such matters have not been progressed by Police Scotland, thereby negating the possibility again. This is the same, same um, uh, issue, I think, to an extent. Explain how the process should work um, where there is a failure in such matters. I think you've already mentioned the triage system, which you, know, you could possibly put in but if this happens on a regular basis, is, is there anything else you can suggest, I think, basically? I think if I can maybe pick up on... I think the issue is, is as I've already touched on, at present, since most of this still resides within the police, it's the police examining themselves and taking the decisions just now because there is no independent decision making at the first stage. That that decision still rests with the police. The triaging system where you decide, well, where does this sit? Is it a criminal allegation? Therefore, pass it to Crown for consideration. Is it a, a serious injury or a serious complaint, in which case it deserves to be independently investigated, or it is, is it a more minor matter that can be resolved through local explanation for, <coughs> or at a local level? Because I think the European Convention recognises you need to set some threshold, because everything can't be moved centrally. It's more minor matters, which are incivility and things, allegations like that, can be more than adequately addressed locally. But the challenge is who takes that decision, which I think is, is what we're discussing here. And at present, the decision rests very much with the police. And we have instances where, in my consideration, knows the decision has been wrong, that it should have been passed onwards, and it did not occur. But the vast majority of complaints do tend to be of the more minor nature. It's the more serious ones that do, I think, need to be subject to scrutiny and effective decision as to where, where should that be investigated. So it's, it's where does that sit and what threshold do you set? And you have um, talked already about serious incidents and... In particular, um, if the case involves a person serving with the police, per concerned about the diversions of legal opinion on whether this applies to officers currently serving or those who were serving at the time. So if it's, it's a diversion of legal opinion, is there something in the Act specifically that we could look at that could tighten that up in any way? That comes down to the point in relation to the resignation retirement of officers as part mm -hmm. of the process. And uh, as we said in the submission, uh, there are varying opinions in terms of how the legislation has been written and in particular the contrast in the section that relates to investigations as contrasted against the, the section that relates to reviews which makes it clear that any act of remission um, which was undertaken by an officer who was at that time of the act of remission serving with the, the police would be capable or be subject to review. That wasn't followed through in relation to the investigation section. So per perhaps an adaptation to basically adopt the same wording. I do think, absolutely think it needs clarity because mm -hmm. we have a differing legal opinion as to what constitutes a person serving with the police. Some consider it's a person currently serving with the police. Others consider it's a person who 
is currently serving or did serve with the police. But there's a distinct lack of clarity and that provides us with a problem. Because at present, if an officer retires or resigns, our investigation, due to the, the opinion we've received, comes to a grinding halt. And I don't think that satisfies anybody. Perhaps helpful being cared, supplement. On that point, if I may, um, so can you elaborate, what is the practical impact of that divergence of legal opinion? Because it sounds as though what you're saying, Mr McSporran, is that there have been a significant number of cases, significant my word, I, I'll ask yeah. you to whether that's fair or not, uh, but a number of cases uh, where uh, the legal opinion that is preferred is the one that says, at the point of resignation or retirement, this stops. Is, is, uh, and that would not be what you would prefer it to be? Yeah, I think the clarity is absolutely necessary. We have council opinion just now that says the interpretation of the, our council's opinions interpretation of the act is that it means a person currently serving with the police. So that's who we can investigate. So we have quite a few examples where we begin an investigation, sometimes in quite serious matters, but the person has retired or resigned at which point we cannot take it forward. And we have a current example, which without going into details, where we're investigating part of the allegations, and it's quite a serious allegation, but it's then had to be passed to an English force for the retired officers, because it can't obviously go to Police Scotland. And I don't find that a satisfactory uh, solution to anything. So I do think there needs to be clarity of the meaning of the Act. I, I, I don't disagree with that but you say you have council's opinion which says one thing does yes. that mean that there is a, a, another council's opinion which says something different or simply that count your council accepts that there is a, an anomaly uh, and this is how it should be interpreted at this moment no, well, <clears throat> our council says it means a person currently serving with the police different council interprets it differently i think the challenge is we should not go if i can describe it as shopping around council to get an opinion that satisfies somebody. So having sought opinion, we need to go with that opinion. And that's why I think there cl there's necessary clarity needed. understand. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, Daniel, supplementary. So following directly on from that, uh, Ian Livingston, when he gave evidence to us, said that if, if that was going to change in terms of your ability to carry on an investigation once a police officer resigns. That should apply to all police officers, um, regardless of, of seniority, so there was consistency. I was just wondering if you'd agree with that specific point, but, and also that then begs the question, surely then all uh, misconduct complaints should be handled by the same place, whereas at the moment senior officers are your remit, whereas the, 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 the junior ranks are... are, are uh, handled internally. Do you think that consistency is important for both those points? Well, dealing with your last point first, I, I understand and I think there perhaps is some sense in relation to, to the split of the process uh, for misconduct. Um, clearly, senior officers cannot investigate themselves or be in charge of those who are investigating them. So it, it makes good sense for those officers uh, to be subject to an independent process away from Police Scotland. Uh, equally, I can understand why the federated ranks potentially should stay within the, the police structure. And, and the other point about if that being able to continue an investigation regardless of resignation, and that should be consistent? Absolutely, yes. Just on the avoidance of doubt, it's section 33 should be extended to cover previously employed uh, policing, um, previously employed by a policing body operating in Scotland since the beginning of the Act. It's section 33 for these previously employed. Section 3 relates to my function. Section 33, sorry. Section 33 of the 2006 Act, which was amended ah, through right. the, the 2012 Act. Right. Uh, that makes sense. But I think it, it does need necessary clarity. Okay, thank you for that. Rona. Yes, thank you. Uh, good, good morning. 
The, you're also concerned that the 2012 Act doesn't distinguish between allegations of on-duty uh, and off-duty criminality by police officers. Um, can, you, can you say that, that should the 2012 Act be amended to address these difficulties? That requires any amendment. The, the legislation, as I said, doesn't uh, distinguish. It's the, the operational practice which has created the difficulty around um, around that process. Um, in particular, um, the Lord Advocate's guidelines that were in force prior to the introduction of this Act remain in force. Now, they relate to when there were um, the various district procreation fiscals and the di different forces. And at, in those guidelines, they, they say that off-duty criminality by police officers it should be reported to the district procurator fiscal in the same way as a member of the public. The practical effect of that is that if an officer potentially becomes involved in criminality whilst off duty, it would naturally be the divisional CID that would uh, take forward the, the investigation. And generally what we have found, albeit there have been some instances more recently where the process has stopped and uh, Crown Office's direction has been sought, but generally what tends to happen is the divisional CID progress their investigation and uh, then subsequently, sometime later, report it to Crown Office as they would a normal member of the public. Now that deprives Crown Office of the opportunity for basically pressing the, the stop button and determining whether an independent investigation should be sought and re-channeling it or redirecting it to me. So, so you think there should be a distinction then um, in terms of how that is? No, I, I don't think there should be a distinction. I, I think the process probably requires to be sharpened up. I think um, that there's a potential for the Lord Advocate's guidelines to be amended to reflect what the legislation currently says. Right, OK. Thank you. Anyone else want to comment on that? Yes, you go. You know, you just to add that we totally agree with the, the point of... Um, the need of clarifications in, in terms of um, uh, members of the police serving, serving with, with the police currently, um, and, and that could also be addressed in, in, in terms of Regulation 5 in cooperation and assistance. So if, if there is a, a, an additional um, numeral that refers to um, ex-police officers or police officers that are not servicing with, with Scotland Police, so it could be addressed in, under Regulation um, five. Um, the, the, the other point and I wanted to make is about the, the mandatory um, referrals. So, um, as probably the, the committee is aware, the, the CPT with the, is the, the Committee for the Prevention of Torture, the European one, was um, visiting um, Scotland a couple of weeks ago, and they they raised a, a number of um, issues in their in their. Um, Final meeting with with, with the government uh, in relation to excessive use of force and um, and of course the, the the entire process is confidential but they will produce a, a, a report in and uh, at the end of this month and that report surely will will send will be sent to you and the, the point that they were making is that um, they they go all, through all the European countries and and they examine. And places the detention and, and the legal framework. And the, the point that we're making that I think is, is, is applicable here is that there is an emerging trend in, in European countries to refer all incidents to the, to the police ombudsman or, or to the commission, uh, the commissioner, rather than that only serious incidents. And, and perhaps that answers some, some, some of your questions and, and inquiries. That's interesting. Yeah. Can I ask you, um, with regard to the 2013 regulations, the, the powers concerned that investigators can be restricted in their enforcement powers when undertaking investigations instructed by the Crown Office. Um, could you maybe expand on that and, and, and on the implications of, of the restriction and, and how it could be resolved? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. Yeah. If, if we look at what Regulation 5 says, so in essence, when it is a police-referred investigation, we can use Regulation 5 to require the police to provide us with information or we can require a police officer to provide us with information, which can be in a form that we decide. So we can uh, require a police officer to give us a statement. 
and that is in police referred matters. But in the more serious matters, which is death investigations or serious crime investigations, where a police officer is a witness, not a suspect, but a witness, we cannot use those powers. And we have had examples where we have had death investigations where police officers have, for a considerable period of time, declined to provide an account or a statement to us. And we cannot use the regulations to, to make that imposition on the police officer to require them. And I think that's unsatisfactory, both from an accountability and particularly from a public perspective perception uh, perspective, because a person has died, I think the public of Scotland, Scottish Parliament, etc., would expect that a police officer who is a witness to the events would give an account of what they saw or what they did. And we do not have those powers just now. And I think it's an anomaly within the regulations where the more minor matter we can use the powers, but in the more serious matters, we do not have powers. And it's where police officers are witnesses, not where they're suspects mm. are accused. Can I, can I ask you to hypothesise why the police wouldn't want to give you that information as a witness? Uh, well, I, I think that would be a matter for, for, for the police to, mm. to address. I, I understand in, in certain circumstances they have received advice um, in individual cases, um, which has... Le legal advice? Uh, police Federation advice. All right, OK. And also, I think, legal advice in certain circumstances. And you, and you've, you, you can't do anything about that, obviously, the, the way things are. There's nothing you can do to compel no, that. It's, it's very strange because um, Section 33 sets out my functions. 33AB deals with the Crown Office and Lord Advocate directed matters. C and D, as, as John has said, relate to um, the matters that can be referred by the, the Chief Constable and D to a public interest investigation. And the regulations, for some strange reason, have focused on C and D and omitted B. OK. Interesting. Thank you. Right. Liam McArthur. Good morning. I just want to pick up on the specific issue of, um, of whistleblowing. I think we've covered a lot of the, the territory in terms of the, the investigation, but there, there are concerns I think the Park have expressed about uh, the lack of independent scrutiny of, of, of whistleblowing. Um, I, I suppose just um, thinking back to the response you gave to Daniel Johnson's question about where there may be instances um, justifying a, 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 a different treatment of um, allegations, for example, against senior officers as compared to, to other officers. Similarly, I suppose, in, in whistleblowing uh, instances, uh, there may, may be appropriate for the whistleblowing to take place to senior officers within uh, within Police Scotland rather than external to, to um, Police Scotland. But I'd be interested to know the position of Park in, in, in relation to how you believe whistleblowing as a whole should be, um, should be dealt with and if there should be any differential treatment uh, applied. Okay. I'm aware that uh, Police Scotland operates th their internal system, uh, Integrity Matters, and I understand that there has been evidence given in relation to that, where staff can anonymously uh, report wrongdoing to the police. That system doesn't provide any external confidential reporting system or mechanism. And I know that uh, from discussions with Police Scotland that they're currently exploring um, the use of an external charity as someone who can receive the whistleblowing um, allegations. However, when I posed the question, what happens to those allegations, the response was that they would be re-diverted back into Police Scotland. Now, I'm aware from um, my colleague down south at the IOPC that following a UK government uh, consultation a couple of years ago, they've introduced new discretionary powers for the IOPC to investigate whistleblowing concerns. Um, and uh, that provides a significant uh, and alternative reporting um, route for whistleblowers to go directly to the IOPC. And it also empowers the IOPC to act on its own initiative without deferring to the police at all. Uh, the IOPC is further empowered to ensure that the identity of uh, whistleblowers is protected and has a power to restrict information uh, provided to the police force when it determines that it's going to investigate a whistleblowing report. So 
The committee or, or the Scottish uh, Parliament may wish to consider um, providing similar powers to the park. See that um, distinct from the triage um, option that was being discussed earlier as, as, as more a question of having two potential options, the, the, the whistleblower being able to choose which of, of those was most appropriate and they felt most comfortable with. Is that Potentially, is that right? yes. Right. I don't know, Mr Kiroth, is, are there human rights implications to, to the way in which whistleblowing um, procedures are, are managed at the, at the present time that you'd want to flag up? And, and I'm very familiar with um, whistleblowing legislation, but um, my understanding is that the, the which, which I should know is, is, is a UK legislation, um, that the legislation provides for external mechanisms. So where there is no uh, confidence in the internal mechanisms, and the, the whistleblower can go directly to uh, external parties, as, as mentioned, and even to journal, uh, journal um, yeah, uh, to reporters or to uh, or to MSPs or members of the parliament. What um, Ms. Williams just described in terms of um, an option of of going to a a, a charity. Um, who would then subsequently provide the information back into the police? I mean, that would not be consistent in terms of your understanding. With, uh, with uh, an adequate uh, accountability framework, I would say no. Yeah. Right. I, I, in terms of the discussions that have been taking place with Police Scotland that, that, that you've uh, had, Commissioner, does there appear to be a willingness to, to explore a more robust mechanism, whether it be one that, that reflects the model that seems to have been adopted? Um, south of the border, or, or is there a, a degree of resistance to that? And if so, um, is there an explanation of that resistance? From the discussions I've had, there does appear to be a clear resistance to that, um, with limited um, justification, it would appear put forward. Thanks. I wonder if I could refer you maybe to a, an additional um, submission we've got from Unison Police Staff Scotland. They weren't able to be represented um, from the police staff angle, and it was specifically on the, the whistleblowing um, where they, they felt that um, positive changes to whistleblowing guidance, which offer greater protection to those um, raising concerns, have been very slow to materialise and that they favoured, you, you've mentioned what happens in England, they favoured um, the expansion of independent scrutiny body, bodies to hear employee complaints um, as they don't think there's right balance just now. Um, and there is a legislative change. And they also referred to um, the positive work underpinned, uh, in, underpinned with permanent structures and guaranteed commitment to work towards implementing the recommendations of Jim Mather's working together review progressive workplace policies in Scotland. Are you familiar with that? And is that something that would aid um, whistleblowing operating as we'd all like it to see? I'm not familiar with that particular piece of work. Uh, I do know, however, from speaking, as I said, to IOPC and other police oversight bodies that they do receive whistleblowing directly into those organisations. Okay. Daniel, supplement. Just following directly on from that, I, I've got two concerns in this space. First of all, is about the complexity for police officers raising complaints. Um, I, I mean, I think it's right that we have proper whistleblowing channels. However, as it stands, we, you've got um, uh, grievances that police officers can raise, uh, professional standards, and my experience from casework that I have is sometimes issues can bounce between different channels, different databases, uh, and really before they're even, you know, the substance is looked at. Is there a need to clarify this, you know, and particularly, you know, thinking about whistleblowing? And, and the, 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 the associated point is, do you believe that it's important that um, whistleblowing gets treated in the right way, regardless of whether or not the person coming forward is, 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 is reporting as a whistleblower to the correct person? I think it is important that they are treated seriously, that they are treated appropriately. Um, the point you make in relation to grievance is interesting because, again, down at the ILPC, um, the conditions of service um, or where matters are already under investigation by a different route 
are not something that uh, are taken on as part of the whistleblowing process. Do you think they should be? I think it's difficult in re relation to terms and conditions um, because it's almost stepping outside the accepted framework. Um, and, and can I just finally, just on that point about treating it appropriately, I mean, do you think there should be protocols in place for senior officers in terms of how they handle whistleblowing? And would you be concerned if a senior officer shared information with the, the subject of a report of uh, whistleblowing? Absolutely. Could I perhaps um, ask uh, you, Mr. Kiros, um, I notice in your submission you're concerned about the 2013 regulations um, which afford the Chief Constable or the SPA the discretion as to whether or not to refer incidents of baton use specifically um, by the police to the PERC for independent review. Could you expand on, on that specific issue? Uh, yes, convener. This is um, what I was uh, referring um, some minutes ago uh, in relation to Regulation 6 and 7. So, uh, Regulation um, 7 covers uh, um, uh, batons as a weapons. And um, what I was trying to say is that um, those incidents uh, are excluded from mandatory referral, but even uh, if the incidents could be what we consider minor, and, and we talk about the, the threshold, uh, they might, uh, uh, and in certain certain circumstances, they certainly will uh, trigger Article um, Three uh, um, requirements of, uh, of procedural investigation. So uh, the point is that uh, it, it is not up to the 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 chief constable or the police authority to refer those circumstances, but it has to be because there is a legal requirement to, to do so. Okay, thank you. Um, we're on to Fulton, please. Uh, thanks, convener. Um, uh, I'm wondering if, if the, the panel, well, particularly probably uh, Diego, could um, elaborate on how the 2012 Act could be improved in regards to, to human rights been articulated as part of the Act. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> there is a, a number of um, uh, outstanding recommendations that we made in 2012, as, as, as you are aware, and, and actually we, we welcome the, the, the significant step, steps that the, the committee and the parliament uh, took uh, uh, to embed human rights, but, but of course there is, there is a number of ones that still are, are relevant today, and particularly if you consider the challenges of, of, of Police Scotland lately, and, and we can mention stop and search, uh, deployment of, of tasers and firearms, the use of cyber kiosk, uh, and the use of biometrics, just to mention a, a few, all of these have a central human rights angle. Um, so human rights are not only important uh, in terms of policing compliance um, with human rights legislation, which Article 6, uh, Section 6 of the Human Rights Act, but also is to ensure that leg legislation uh, drives best practice in Scotland. So the, the, there are two, two ways to, to, to see that. There is a, a structural issues that remain outstanding, and there are um, specific provisions. Um, in terms of, of the structural issues and how to, to improve the, the current framework, um, there are three in particular um, that, uh, without going for far away, happen in, in, in Northern Ireland, the uh, police service in Northern Ireland, which we consider has one of the best um, models uh, of embedding human rights into the uh, uh, process and, uh, and legislation. So one is the, the, the creation of an independent human rights, human rights uh, advisor for the force. Uh, the second is the introduction of mechanisms to protect uh, and to promote transparency and democratic accountability within uh, local communities. And, and the third is uh, training for all new and existing uh, officers, police officers and uh, within the uh, Police Scotland in human rights, of course. And, and we are missing most of these mechanisms in, in, in Scotland. Now, in terms of the act, um, human rights can be more explicit in, in general and um, through the act, and I mentioned some of the provisions in, in, in relation to PERC that uh, omits uh, Article 2, 3, and 8 requirements, but also in sections 32, 33 of the act, um, they could be uh, 
enhance but, but including some of the human rights provisions. Chapter 16 as well, um, um, we welcome the, the explicit uh, reference to OPCAD. I think this is both unique and, and progressive for the parliament and actually the, the UK parliament is, is trying to, to copy something similar to what you did in 2012. Um, but and the committee might want to consider extending the OPCAD provisions in the act to inspection of custody by HMICS. And I w I'm, a, I'm quite aware that the HMIC has already raised this, this with you. And um, HMICS is a member of the UK NPM and helps to deliver OPCAD obligation in Scotland. So it makes practical and legal sense to reflect this reality into the inspection of police, police custody in, as conducted by HMICS. Um, Section 94 or in, in the chapter 16 can also be enhanced, but uh, in order to meet uh, the objectives of OPCAT uh, and, and be human rights compliant. So there is a number of provisions that if, 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 if you want me to go through them, I, I could be enhanced through uh, well, thank, human rights lens. Thanks very much for a, for a, for a very full answer. But um, can I ask you specifically about the, the code of ethics uh, for policing? I know that you've You've noted that there is a code of ethics for uh, policing, but no provision in the 2012 Act. Um, but you believe that it should be on a statutory phone. Can you expand on that? Th that's correct. <laughs> Thank you uh, for, for mentioning that, which I, I forgot to, <laughs> to say. Uh, um, th there is a code of ethics, and which I think, if I am correct, the Act does not uh, make provision for the code of ethics. But there is, anyway, a code of ethics, ethics for policing in Scotland. And we welcome that it has an explicit um, reference to human rights and the way how police officers' uh, obligations operate under the, the Human Rights Act. But we think that the act uh, could um, and, and should be placed on a statutory foot, foot, footing, as is, is the case in, in Northern Ireland, as, as referred is one of the best um, models that, that we could um, have. Um, for instance, uh, the, the police ombudsman uses the code of ethics to classify complaints made against the police. And it's important that the police uh, service, the police authority and, and the, the commissioner, and share a common and ethical base that, um, and that is evident in every aspect of policing. So the, the, the code of ethics will provide a common framework and a valuable uh, tool to ensure that the police service complies with the Human Rights Act. And so that's why we consider that it should be in a statutory foot, footing and, and that the, this parliament and, and this committee will have a, a say on, on the content of, of, of that um, a document that code of ethics and, and it will be reviewed regularly. So that will, give, um, that will match the, the, the character that I mentioned of human rights uh, as a, as a um, living, um, instrument, um, but also it will give more uh, legal precision to the uh, operational aspect of policing. Thank you, uh, convener. I think I had a, another question around the uh, custody visit, but I think that was actually um, that was actually referred to in, in, in Diego's uh, initial answer. So I just wanted to sort of uh, finalise by saying, put my other hat on as a Qualities and Human Rights Committee um, member as well. Um, it, it's great to have this as part of the scrutiny. Um, so credit to the clerks and hopefully uh, yourself, Diego, or other folk from the uh, Scottish Human Rights Committee will be regular attendees at future scrutiny. Um, I wonder, Mr Kiros, if there's anything else that you, you haven't mentioned in, in terms of the 2013 regulations that you think we should be aware of um, that you think should be amended? Just, um, no, just reiterate that Human Rights Act uh, has an added value to, to, to this. And, and the, uh, the member already mentioned that, and I'm grateful for that. Um, and the example that I give you is the, the failure to add Article 2 and 3, but also the, the failure to, to consider uh, those requirements. So there's nothing about victim participation, so this is something that it could be added. There is nothing about uh, open to public scrutiny, that's something that could be added. And, and, and probably the, the other point, um, and the commissioner could uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is, is, is the, the power of PERC to 
uh, assess and evaluate and report on sy systemic issues, which is absent on also in, 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 in the regulations. And, and that's something that um, other um, commissioners, and, and again, referencing, referring to Northern Ireland, have the power to report on um, systemic issues. And, and, and they have found this very helpful in, in, in those jurisdictions. Give an example. Uh, yeah, so the, there is um, another jurisdiction, the, the, the PER has explicit power to conduct more general reviews of police practices and, and, and policies. So they, they analyze anything in, in relation um, to what are those police, police practices and, 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 and operational issues from a human rights angle. Uh, so they, they monitor uh, and the, the incidents and, and the practices in relation to a specific human rights obligations. And they report on, on those obligations. And if they find a systemic issue, a systemic fail, fa failure, they report as well on, on that. So not exclusively or, or not only on, on, on incidents, but in systemic failures that they find within the, the police practices and policies. Would there any, be any comment you'd like to, to make? Yes, I'd pick up on that. I, I would endorse the thinking behind that. In Scotland, uh, HMICS would generally take forward thematic reviews, um, pulling out systemic issues. And we have close consultation with HMICS in relation to matters that emerge um, from any number of our reports. So would you be satisfied that your powers are um, good enough at present? In that, in that regard, you wouldn't be looking for anything further, quite happy with the, the liaison with HMICS? Yes, um, there's adequate uh, liaison with HMICS. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Liam Kerr, supplementary. Thank you, Convener. Mr Kieroff, the, the SHRC made various recommendations, uh, both before the 2012 Act and around the regulation of investigations in, in times past. Looking at your evidence, the, many of these weren't taken forward. Uh, do you recollect or can you enlighten the committee as to why they weren't taken forward, what the thought process of the legislature was at that time, uh, and what has changed? Um, I'm, 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 I'm afraid that I won't be able to... To, to give you a specific reason why they, 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 they were not taken forward. So some of them were taken forward and, 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 and we normally interact with the parliament, as, as you know, and, and both in, in a written and a, um, an, an oral way. So we provide our recommendations to the parliament and um, during a stage one, and um, we try to follow through a stage two. Um, but the, the underlying circumstances or the rationale why they were not taken forward. I'm, I'm afraid that I, I will not be able to, to comment on that. Um, but, but yes, it's, 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 uh, I, I, I don't know if you were expressing some concern, but I share your concern if, if that's what you're expressing. Because um, the, the evidence that we have now is that um, those recommendations were um, relevant and they are still relevant today. I'd just like to ask you about some of the, the evidence you've given in writing regarding the independence of the SPA and the ministers, uh, Scottish minister's relationship to both the SPA and the police. I mean, you've said uh, 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 that, first of all, that the SPA should have independence power to set its own strategic priorities, and, but moreover, um, that the, the ability for ministers to direct um, the police should be uh, uh, limited. Could you maybe just elaborate on that? And are there any sort of specific examples uh, where, where you believe that the, 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 the actions of, of ministers have undermined kind of human rights because the, of the use of the powers as they stand um, at the moment? Um, yes, thank you very much. Um, Section 33 of the Act provides that the Scottish minister might determine the strategic police authorities and police priorities for the SPA. Furthermore, Section 5 um, also provides the SPA must comply with uh, any specific or general direction given by a Scottish minister. And, it, and this could be understandable uh, in terms of harmonisation of 
uh, national outcomes, uh, for, for instance. But there is also disadvantages to, to, to this approach. And from, from these two provisions, we could say that the Scottish Minister have a comprehensive power to direct SPA. And, 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 and the examples, there are no specific examples in, in terms that they have happened or that I am aware that they happened, but it could be in relation about number of deployment of staff, or it could be about uh, the style of policing. Um, so the Commission believes um, that the power given to the Scottish Minister in the Act represents a significant challenge uh, to the independence of uh, SPA and the integrity of the police uh, accountability framework. So in the Commission view, uh, as, 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 as you, you mentioned, is, is our view that the Scottish Minister should only retain the power to set principles and overall objectives for policing. And the SPA should have the independence and power to set his own strategic priorities. So I mean, one, one suggestion that has been made in this space is that there should be formal protocols regarding kind of the communication both between uh, ministers and uh, the police themselves and, and also the SPA. Uh, is that something you think that would be welcome and might help clarify uh, this relationship and ensure that that, that, that uh, overt direction by, by ministers could, would be limited? Yes, yes, I, I think that will, will other some, some, some of the issues that will, will cure some of the, some of the uh, disadvantage of, of the model adopted by the Act. And, and likewise, the appointment of SPA uh, board members and the SPA uh, chair uh, themselves. I mean, that, the, the, the SPA chair is obviously a, a ministerial appointment. I mean, is that something that you, 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 you're saying should be changed and the appointment of the, 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 the chair should reside elsewhere? And if so, where? The, we're saying that there is other account, greater accountability, and, uh, accountability models to deal with that, so um, uh, in the past, uh, the election, local authorities were highly involved in, in that election and in, in, in that process of uh, election. So, if if we have a, a, a wider uh, engagement, then it will solve some of the those issues that arise today about direct uh, direction of. of and influence from the Scottish Minister to the SPA. So, uh, just one final point. I mean, I, I believe it's of fundamental importance to enshrine the principle of policing by consent yeah. uh, right the way through the governance structures of the police. Uh, at the moment, um, essentially because of the, the, the way that the SPA is appointed and, and those lines of accountability, it's unclear to me precisely where the policing by consent sits. Do you, do you think that's something that could be focused on and improved in terms of how the SPA functions to ensure that the policies that it's setting, that the priorities that it's setting are actually in line with, with what the, the, the public consent to in terms of how they <coughs> wish to be policed? Absolutely. And I think um, having a, a rights-based approach and uh, is, is in line with the, that idea of policing by consent, which is um, incredibly progressive, even if it's, it's incredibly old as well. Um, the, the idea of policing by consent is not everyone will agree with, with the police, but, but, but that policing is open, is transparent, is, 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 is mutu, mutually reinforcing, and is, is founded on, on on human rights, and, and actually, the, 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 what the police does is, is to protect our fundamental rights. So th there should be a, a alignment of, of those ideas, and, and, and that could be enhanced. Yeah. I perhaps again refer you to the Unison um, supplementary submission we've got from the police staff, Scotland, where they say that. Um, the role of ministers in shaping our national police service needs to, to have greater clarity, more openness uh, about ministerial decision making and how decisions are arrived at and applied and, count of, uh, and accounted for. And they suggest this should be by way of records and minutes being taken and um, openly available. Would that be something that you think would be um, 
a way to go to, to try and get this transparency and openness. I think that part of the challenge is that that is very much a decision for yourselves and the Scottish Parliament as to, I, I mean, I'm probably straying into an area that is your domain, which is, you know, Parliament, uh, government needs to set strategic directions and provide that uh, strategic direction for the police force. Uh, they, need to, they need to set some boundaries, some objectives for where it wants to take uh, the Scottish Police Service, and I think that's, that's quite right. Uh, how open do you want that to be? How transparent do you want to be, that to be? Uh, again, it's a very much a matter for the Scottish Parliament, uh, because sometimes there does need to be those initial conversations as to, as to shaping where things go. Uh, but there needs to be a degree of openness and transparency there. But I do very much think it's, it's a matter back to, to yourselves. Perhaps more a, a human rights. If, if um, we haven't got to the bottom of how a decision was made, then um, if it affects a complaint against someone, then you would expect minutes and um, a record of the decision to be... Um, to be available so that there is accountability. And can I go a little bit further on this submission? Um, they go on to say it's been very difficult to deduce where ministerial advice and guidance start and instruction, direction and intervention end. And in their view, this impacts on the credibility of the single force in appearing free from political interference as a legitimate entity. So they are looking at greater transparency, improved standards, building on the support of um, the support for, for example, um, the adoption of a lobbying register. And they're looking at what happens then. Uh, the ministerial directional te technical directional reporting of the process between the UK government departments and the national office or audit office and I suppose they're saying an analogous um, body in Scotland would be Audit Scotland to provide better scrutiny on the governance and role of ministers and reveal their value and direction so I suppose there is a human rights aspect here for this transparency and openness in dealing with anyone's um, particular issue. Uh, absolutely, and, um, but I, I, I concur with, with your point. I think the, in, a, in areas policing, there the, the should be, of course, there the should be a, a, a balance between the public interest and then and the, the prevention of, 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 of crime, um, but as much openness and, and transparency as is possible is, is, is always welcome and, um, and that's why we have uh, recommended uh, to the police in, in, in particular to have a human rights based approach to, to policing which involves um, uh, four areas in particular that is policy and um, strategic decision making, operational planning and deployment, training and guidance and investigation monitoring and scrutiny, which is the, the area that we are focusing today. But a, a rights-based approach is, is, about, uh, is, is about having this quite abstract idea in those embedded in those specific areas. So it's looking at, at policy from everything from policing to uh, training, deployment, and investigation through a human rights lens. <laughs> and if I could perhaps maybe just uh, finally ask you, Ms. Green. Then you mentioned the, um, the article uh, Regulation 5 needed to be amended for the COPFS directed investigations. And they also um, suggest, I think you also suggested that there should be defined timescales which are required for this information to be provided. Would that be the case? Yes. Yeah. Can I ask you, therefore, um, when we were looking at the investigation of complaints against senior officers, if you think they should be prioritised given the length of time it appears to have taken to, to deal with these? Yes, I, I agree that all uh, those investigations, in fact, all investigations should be undertaken as quickly as possible, and we do our level best to achieve that. 
However, there have been a number of issues that have impacted on our ability to deliver on that. Um, when an investigation comes into us, we assess its nature and complexity, and then we allocate it as a Category A, a Category B, or a Category C investigation. Um, category A is the most serious, and I can confirm that each of the, the recent significant um, investigations that we have undertaken have been categorised as a Category A investigations. Um, last year there were particular features around some of those investigations and it certainly we were drip fed a number over a concentrated six month period. Um, Throughout that period, we were also dealing with a number of other competing investigations, some of which involved potential criminality against police officers or about police officers, some involving uh, deaths uh, following police contact. However, almost on a daily basis, there, there was some progression of the, the significant investigations, and we did prioritise those, but we had to juggle the priorities, and I know that Mr Mitzvoran probably wants to elaborate on that because he had uh, first-hand sharp experience of it. Yes, uh, I think the challenge from my perspective leading investigations is to what priority do I attach to, for example, a senior officer misconduct investigation versus a death investigation or a serious injury investigation. And as head of investigations, my priority is always providing a service to the relatives of the deceased, so my focus will always, my priority will always be death investigations. Uh, and I think that's entirely right. Thereafter, I've got to balance the demand on my investigations department. Last year, we had a significant increase in the volume and the severity of the number of investigations we were expected to undertake. And I had limited resources, so I had to balance those resources across those competing priorities. And what that means is that those investigations that are of a lesser priority will take longer because I simply don't have enough resources. But the Scottish Government did recognise that we were severely strained. And at the start of this year, they increased uh, the money allocated to Puck and allowed me to expand the number of investigators that I had. Consequently, if the same demand was presented as we got last year, uh, if that hit us now, am I better placed to deal with it? Absolutely, uh, because I've got more resources now. But when you had limited resources, it's balancing. Where do you put those resources against the importance of the investigations and to be quite blunt, an employment or a contractual thing versus a death investigation, my priority is the death investigation. I think in general terms that sounds very sensible. When it involves the chief constable of the force, then there's a paralysis um, which descends on the whole police force. It's got a disproportionate effect. And in these circumstances, laying aside the resources, which I think to an extent you're, you're suggesting has been addressed given the increased volume, um, would it not now, with the benefit of hindsight, be best to deal with even a minor complaint um, against the Chief Constable uh, as a matter of priority so that the police force can get on to, to function and we can sort out what is a substantive um, complaint and, and what is something that um, is, is not causing particular concern? Absolutely, I, I do agree with you on that point. I think the challenge was, in the specific one that you mentioned, it's the nature of how that arrived with PERC. Because from the point that it was initially received by the SPA, it then took 10 weeks to arrive with us. We acted on it immediately. But that was the first complaint involving a series of allegations. Several weeks later, a second complaint arrives with further allegations. And over the course of the next six to seven months, further complaints and further allegations are made. And I think some people think that this all arrived as one investigation. It was spaced out over a prolonged period of time, requiring us to go back and interview the same people. So if it had been a single allegation and could be dealt with quickly, yes, absolutely, I would agree with you. We would prioritise that due to the what you flagged up as the reputational risk and the damage. 
But in that particular instance, that occurred over a prolonged period of time, so it was not practical to adopt that approach. Can I tease that out a little? There was a 10-week delay in receiving the, the complaint from the SPA, was that right? Yes. Yes. So should there be a, a time frame? Should there be something on that? Is there any way to, to address that, that issue? Because that in itself, I think, is, is, is concerning. I think that should be directed towards the SPA. SPA, OK. And in terms of, is there a danger here? that um, a complaint is lodged and, OK, we could deal with that. But then another complaint is lodged and another complaint. Now, these could be vexatious complaints. Meanwhile, the clock is ticking. The reputational damage um, is being done the longer it, it takes. How do we address this, this issue? Is that a concern for you? And how would you suggest that could be... Um, resolved so that it isn't a case of we just pile on enough complaints then uh, perhaps I think it's, it's part of the assessment process by the SPA uh, where they examine the matter now I know they had council opinion and I heard the evidence they gave here where in essence when they get it they, re they send it onwards to PERC but we have examples in some of the more recent ones where if there had been an assessment process undertaken, uh, and I'll use a, a specific example without going into too much detail, where it was a matter of the employment contract of the person concerned. Now, that was sent to us for investigation. We begin to investigate it, then we determine it's actually a contractual matter, and the SPA had the answer all, of the, all the time. Therefore, there was actually no need for that matter to be referred to us in the first instance. So I think a more effective assessment and analysis when it first arrives can then determine, and that would potentially address this issue of the vexatious matters, where what's getting passed on is something that's considered a matter of serious misconduct as opposed to contract or whatever else. So that could be built in, in, in retrospect, more, um, more dialogue. Can I ask you, Ms. Strain, then, you've been in post since really the, the inception of the, the new Act. Can you point to maybe improvements, how things worked in the past, and, and where we are now uh, with both how SPA and Police Scotland um, conduct complaints and, and I suppose flag up the things that you absolutely would want to be addressed by this committee in our post-legislative scrutiny? Mm -hmm. I think it, it's fair to say that initially there was considerable resistance to PERC as an organisation and in relation to referring matters to us. That has um, improved over the period. We're see we are seeing, despite all that's been said here today, we are seeing a greater number of referrals from Police Scotland, uh, particularly in relation to um, serious injuries. Um, however, there is that nagging concern um, that still there is a bulk that we are not seeing and that will only come to us through the, the route of the complainers coming uh, through the review process. Um, as regards the SPA, uh, I think the, the difficulties that organisation has um, seen are well documented and uh, I don't want to offer any further comment on that. But I suppose there have been even uh, the Unison um, refer to uh, now a variety of different forums, wellbeing, surgeries. I mean, things have moved on a little bit. Are you seeing um, improvements? Well, in relation to the SP, you'll be aware last year we undertook an audit which threw up um, a number of um, features which I'm aware the, the SP are now beginning to address and uh, dealing with. And I'm, I'm hopeful that um, those improvements will shine through shortly. Would that require legislative change, some of the improvements? Should we go back to the legislation to see how we can make sure it's there regardless of who is in post. Mm -hmm. I think that's less to do with the SPA. In relation to legislative changes, uh, we, we've talked already about the officers serving with Police Scotland. I think there would be the potential for a legislative change around that. Um, in relation to the regulations, we, we're looking for 
the strengthening of the current Regulation 5 so that that attaches as well to Crown directed um, matters. Um, we, we spoke, Mr Quero spoke in relation to the human rights aspect and I suggested at the beginning of the session that Section 41B and 33, which relates to the serious incidents, because, and Mr Kerr, I think you, you said what's changed, what's moved on, I think the threshold of human rights cases in relation to severity um, now points to, I suppose, a lesser level um, of uh, injury or infringement of the Article 2. So whilst when the Act was initially formulated, it, it specified serious incident, uh, there is now case law to the effect even that a single slap to someone uh, who's in the process of being detained would infringe their Article 3 rights. So it may be, as I said earlier, that it would be appropriate for serious incidents to be replaced with the potential uh, inference of a breach of Article 2 or 3. Right, that's, that's helpful. And just finally, Mr Kiros, in, in terms of human rights, is there anything we haven't covered um, that you would like to see in the Act? No, I think we, we go over everything yeah. that we have. And Thank I you do very take much. your point about the 2000 Act stating SPM must try to carry out its functions in a way oh. that is proportionate and it should be required yeah. to. We take that on board. That concludes our um, questions. Can I thank you all very much for attending today. And that's been quite an illuminating um, evidence session. We now suspend to allow the witnesses to leave. Agenda item three is consideration of the Prisons and Young Offenders Institution Scotland Amendment Rules 2018 SSI 2018 oblique 293. I refer members to paper three, which is a note by the clerk. Do <coughs> members have any comments they wish to make regarding this SSI? If there are no comments, this committee agree that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument. Agreed, thank you. The next agenda item is consideration of the reports from HIMCS and HMIPS on home detention curfews and also the response so far from the Scottish Government in the form of the ministerial statement. I refer members to paper four, which is a note by the clerks. Um, just before I ask members for their views on reports, I, I wanted to put on record the condolences of the committee to the McClelland family. I also want to note that the committee paused its consideration of the Management of Offenders Bill to await the publication of those two independence reports and we'll shortly consider how we wish to proceed. Um, in the meantime, I invite members to comment on the issues raised in the two independent reports and response from the Cabinet Secretary in the Chamber. Any comments? I think we're agreed that there's a, a number of issues um, raised in these two reports and um, it would be our intention to, to cover these and how that will affect our work in private session. Liam MacArthur. Yeah, thanks, uh, Convener. And thank you for extending the condolences of the committee, um, which is entirely a, a, a appropriate. But it strikes me that there's, um, there's a good deal of, of, of substance to both reports. 
not necessarily uh, a great deal of it that, that points in the direction of, of legislative changes. But nevertheless, I think it's, it's policy changes and, and practice changes that absolutely, as a committee, we will need to uh, make sure that we keep a, a, an eye on. Uh, over the over the months ahead uh, and I think where there are proposed um, changes uh, referred to by the, the Justice Secretary uh, I think there's a, a there is time now to, to, to factor those into our consideration of the, the legislation and my, my preference would probably be to to do that ahead of um, ahead of stage one if we're to take evidence rather than um, uh, at, at stage two where I think we can maybe find ourselves um, running out of time um, I, I, but I, I, I think it was absolutely right for us to, to stall the process. I think that's been justified by the, um, by the detail of the report that's come forward. Uh, thank you for that comment. And uh, Liam Kerr? Uh, simply to associate myself with Liam MacArthur's comments, I think that's uh, exactly right. Yes, we, we were very mindful of the um, sensitivities around this. Um, George Adams? I just say uh, I agree with everything that every, all my colleagues have said because I think it was right that we stopped it to get this information and how we deal with the situation now between uh, the, the recommendations that have been made by the reports and also the fact that the Cabinet Secretary has gone on the record and said he'll accept all the recommendations. We've got an opportunity within this legislation to actually try and make some of these changes and I think uh, take the evidence uh, in stage one of the authors of the report and then possibly uh, when we go into stage two look at how we can actually do that. Uh, I think um, members of the public and the McLean family can be um, assured that the, we will give and make sure the stage one report is the very best that it possibly can be in light of these two reviews and the ministerial statement. So if um, you're content with that, then we... That includes the public part of today's meeting. Our next meeting will be on the 13th of November when we will continue with our post-legislative scrutiny of the Police and Fire Reform Scotland Act 2012. And we now move into private session.